My name is Emmanuel Kulu. I am the author and African historian of I Black Pharaoh Rise to Power, also I Black Pharaoh Universe. I am the founder of IBP Media. Um, our goal is to uh, bring forth to light the true African imagery of ancient Kemet, which is ancient Egypt, and also bring forth the untold African truths of African history. That is very interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, let me let me hang on a little bit on the untold uh, story. That, that is going to be very important now because we are talking of the people who are actually the beginning of human history and their story right. is untold. That is almost like a kind of um, a contradicting as it were. What, what do you mean by, by that actually, by untold story? Well, the untold story, starting with Egypt being the first mega civilization the world has ever seen, it's very important to see it in its African context. When you go into, into Egypt, Cairo, um, as well as Aswan, you can see that on as you go into these museums, you can see that these were African people, but they've never been depicted as African people throughout the world, whether it's through films, whether it's through novels, whether it's through um, any type of depiction, uh, curriculum, school curriculum, they've never been depicted as Africans as they were. So what we hear uh, doing at I Black Pharaoh Universe, we really wanna show the beauty of African history starting with ancient Egypt because it was the monarch of all civilization. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that, uh, Emmanuel. Now, I want to dig a little bit about you. Uh, personally, um, tell us uh, when you were uh, much much younger. No? How did you start mm -hmm. to uh, get notice of this information? Because this, of course, this is another this is another information that generally share uh, in the right. mainstream media. Like, of course, you are a testimony of that. No, because you are in the mm -hmm. United States, right? Right. Right. Okay. I'm, you, in, I'm in New York. Yep. You're, in, you're in New York. Okay. So tell me, uh, tell us a little bit when you were growing. How did you begin to uh, to filter this information to sort of Pay attention to, to this aspect that you're talking about. Yeah, um, it started with my father. My father being from Cameroon um, of the Bantu uh, Zulu tribe, he really wanted to you know educate his children on our glorious African history. Because what we've been told here in America, we've been told that only thing that, that Black people have done was be slaves here in America for 400 years. And my father never wanted us to have that slave mentality. He wanted us to know the beauty of our African history. So when I was in about fourth or fifth grade, um, we were doing a project on a great uh, person of antiquity. And I decided to, uh, me and my father decided to do King Tut. And we made sure we, we, we put, got some cardboard, we got a mannequin, uh, we got everything and put it together really nicely. Um, spray painted it gold, the parts of it gold and blue. Uh, royal blue for the Egyptian colors, and um, we presented it. And we made sure that we painted King Tut as a dark-skinned man. Um, so I brought it to school, and the teacher at the time gave me a B minus. Now, my, my project, we worked the hardest on it compared to everybody else in the classroom. But for the simple fact that we painted him black was the reason why the teacher said it was historically inaccurate. And I was so sad and brother, and I was sad because, you know, I worked really hard on the project and, you know, I watched my father at the end of the day, argue with my teacher about Egypt being Af Egyptians, ancient Egyptians being Africans. And the teacher just wouldn't budge was saying, no, they weren't Africans. They were white people. So this is why I got a B minus. So that kind of led a fire in me, brother, from back then, from fourth grade. To, to this very day to prove that ancient Egyptians were black African people. So as I grew up, you know, I grew up in and started to get into the music industry, got into the film industry, but I started thinking more and more about my African lineage and bringing forth the truth. So I started doing a lot of research, a lot of traveling back and forth to the continent and really trying to bring the truth um, because you even find brothers on the continent who don't even know this information. So I was really a, a just lot, trying to a lot of the a lot a lot of us. Okay, okay, please yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, as, as I started to do that, I was like, okay, how can we change this? The real way to change anything is through media, is through literature, and through education. So I decided to start in literature. So doing my own research on Egypt, um, I wanted to bring a powerful 
historical fiction. And, and that's what you have with I Black Pharaoh Rise to Power and I Black Pharaoh Golden Age of Triumph. Of course, we're going to come to uh, go a little bit deeper into that project of yours. Um, but just now, I'd like to try to understand you still growing up now. And because that is very important, because like you already strike now, it is very important that some people know that you don't just jump out and begin to write, no? You write because right. there are things that are sort of that are inner motivation that sort of motivate you to write about what write on what you write about, also the kind of subject that you write and what you give emphasis to. So it's very important. Now, when you were much younger, also I'm remaining in those period, you were having some conversation with your parents. I want to believe that, no? So when mm -hmm. you come to history, what kind of argument were you having? I mean, like, of course, you could see that things were different in the society. Maybe you living you living in the US, no? So right. how was the conversation like? How, what was the thing that, that you were talking about often? Yeah, my 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 mother, she is African American, um, but she always really wanted to connect with her African lineage. Um, so she was affiliated with movements called like the Black Panthers. She was also affiliated with other uh, black movements in the the seventies um, because she really wanted to be empowered by Pan Africanism. Um, so it, it was a good thing that she got to meet my father, who was actually an African man who helped her uh, to understand her African history, as well as he learned more about the African-American history. So it was a nice balance for us. So we was always growing up, growing up with uh, proud African roots, whether it be on the African-American side or the African side. Uh, my mother was a, a history teacher as well as um, a social studies teacher, uh, English teacher. So she was already an educator. So for us coming up, we already learned from our father, from you know the spiritual side from her, and as well as the, uh, the African history from him and her. So we come from a family of educators as it is, and we really just grew up in that light. And we wanted to share it with everyone else around us because we found here in America, a lot of our brothers and sisters don't know where they come from. And that's due to what you've been taught. You know, it's kind of like one of those things in America, they say, well, black people just fell on the earth and all of a sudden became slaves. And that was it. That is basically the history in America <laughs> <laughs> about black people. Um, so uh, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. And yes, we love Dr. King. We love Malcolm X and all of those other brothers. But we have great ancestors such as Yash Shantawe, such as uh, Queen Habshetsu, such as Shaka Zulu, such as, such as Mansa Musa, uh, such as Abu Bakari the, the, the second. So, you know, we have great leaders of, of, of well-known African kingdoms that have never been taught in American school curriculums. So I come from that and my parents always educated me on that, even when the school system wasn't. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank your parents for what they have done because it, it helped to uh, light a little candle in the dark. I mean, you uh, growing up now with all the instrument that is available today at the internet technology, of course you are able to fine tune a narration, which is going to inspire also the generation that is going to come after you. So that is very, very important. This is the last question I'm going to ask you here before we move to the story itself. So when you were still much younger at this time that you were having this conversation, it's kind of um, a lighty conversation with your parents. And of course, you go out, you meet your friends and they do have your regular conversation in the bar or the road. What, when you share with them what you were hearing from your parents, what was their reaction? I mean, what were they thinking also? Um, as I got older, the reactions got better. But when I was a young man, um, you know, you, you had a lot of denial of Africanism in the black community, you know, uh, black Americans would just say, Hey, I'm not from Africa. You know, I'm not African, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm American. So they really weren't in tune with it when I was a young man, but as Pan-Africanism has grown and as black history has grown, we start to see it being more well-received people trying to connect back to their ancient roots. And also you now have uh, what you call AfricanAncestry.com, which is becoming a very big thing in the black community, which is helping blacks connect back to what actual place in Africa they were from. So a lot of people are um, opening their minds to it. But when I was young, you know, there was a separation there. There was definitely a separation to where, you know, people didn't want to be African for the fact that they thought Africa was a bush place. 
uh, Africa was they were told in their education system that Africa's poor, Africa is full of famine, Africa is full of disease, Africa is where e HIV and Ebola came from. This is what they're being told in, in America about Africa. And what are they being told in Africa about African Americans? They're being told that African Americans are violent thugs and street people and have no culture. This has created this separation in the diaspora that we see that's happening today. So um, my goal was always to stand in the middle and unite the African continent and the African-Americans. And it's, and, it's, and it's interesting that you asked this question, brother, because in the 1960s, the number one threat for America was not to allow African-Americans to connect back with Africa. This was the number one threat to the government. So this is how important this is for us to actually do that, to know our history and to know where we come from, because the even the actual government fear of uprising did not want to see African-Americans do that. So we must do so. Uh, we need to sort of change the narration. And I thanks to people like you that are taking time to really look at the story, because even when we stay writing that African people are not documenting their history, it is mm -hmm. even very delicate as a case because we need to look at it very well. Uh, one can just go there and regurgitate, like many African historians do, go there and regurgitate what the European people have written about Africa. And they, because you are an African telling the story, it makes it sort of legitimate. But it is that you are doing more harm than good in that right. you, as an African, you really need to go down and dig the story. Or because the story is about you, you don't have any reason to be regurgitating what the Europeans have written in terms of African history, in terms of what history even because history is nothing more than just his whole version of the story, the story it's called yeah. his story his whole story so that is what it should be so i think yeah. we should be bold enough to write history according to how we understand it according to how it makes sense to us not according to what is, what is what is, there is nothing like general history that is nothing like a uh, history without huh. sentiment that is why i think right. uh, ben was saying um that why people cannot teach black history? It, it doesn't make sense. Cannot. Because there are a lot of people cannot. that are involved in that. Right. And, then, and, and you know, you had great historians like Shek N.T. Diop, like uh, Dr. Ben, like Ivan Van Sertma, like Ranoku Rashidi, like Kaba Kabane. These are a, a lot of great brothers that have been speaking this truth for a long time. Um, but they've been labeled as Afrocentrics and they've been debunked by Eurocentric scholarship. And it's been vast proof. I mean, you're talking about uh, Ivan Van Sertman's discussion on, on Africans and the discovery of America. There's lots of evidence of uh, African people already being in America uh, before Columbus, but the denial continues. The denial continues because the, the fear of an uprising of Africans knowing who they truly were. Shek Anti Diop, he, he spoke on uh, these issues about Egypt on how Egyptians describe themselves as no different than the Ethiopian people in the tomb of Ramses the, 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 the second, I believe. And he also challenged the Egypt, Egyptian antiquities um, and mentioned how the melanin levels were no different in ancient Egyptian mummies that he had tested. I believe he tested over 150 common people mummies in Egypt and found that they are, um, just no different than any other sub-Saharan African that they have labeled. So there have been many brothers that have fought this fight. It's just that Eurocentric scholarship will continue to try to debunk them for the simple fact that they fear uh, the, the, the knowledge and the understanding of true African history going around the world. But that's inevitable. It's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen anyway. I like that. I like that. I like that courage. Because I think this is the time for us to really take up the story. It, it doesn't even make sense that Egypt is white. It doesn't make any sense. If they, if they are white, where did they come from? They came from Europe. Egypt, I'm rich the European history didn't even develop yet. Exactly. So did they, are, they, are they coming from Asia? Are they Chinese? But why would they <laughs> come from China to develop Africa? Because at the time, if you take it on the timeline, just look at the achievement in Egypt, pair it up with Asia, it is not that is the, the time no is similar. different. So, it, it, in, fact, in fact, there are more pyramids in Sudan, uh, which was the ancient Kush. Um, and there's more pyramids there 
there are other there are more other pyramids throughout the African continent that aren't discussed. I mean, we can talk about the Benin, the people of Benin. Uh, we could talk about a lot of other pyramids that have been discovered that are have no connection to Europe whatsoever or Asia. So we know that the pyramid building started in Africa and it even started below Egypt, which many would call ancient Kush or ancient Ethiopia. So um, that's 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 extensive proof right there that pyramid building was exclusively an African thing. And also the idea, the philosophy behind even the structure itself or the pyramid is something that needs to be explained because now you go to Washington, you know, you see that because this uh, European Western historian, they think they are very intelligent by going around saying that Africa have no history because in the past, a lot of historian in uh, of Western historian have written a lot to show that Africa have no history. But in that case, somebody can make a very simple and uh, ask a very simple question. How come that in the Vatican City, Rome, we have obelisks? Obelisks mm -hmm. is not, not, not a European invention. What is the pyramid structure doing in Paris? And what we, is, and, and we also, doing? the priest also wears the, the, the white crown of, of Horus. <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, uh, you know, you have the obelisk that's here in the America um, of Tutmosis the third. Um, so obviously these, uh, the American civilization, even if you turn around the dollar bill, you see a pyramid there, uh, the U.S. dollar. So these have they have always given reference to Egypt. In fact, Rome, Greece, all these civilizations that came before America, um, they always gave reference to Egypt. Think about. If you really take a think about Egypt, right, Egypt, the Babylonians came into Egypt, the Assyrians came into Egypt, the Greeks came into Egypt, the Romans came into Egypt, everyone came into Egypt to learn and study. You have a man named Herodotus who talks about the antiquities of Egypt being the oldest of all men. Um, as well as the Ethiopians being considered the oldest of all men. And what does that term Ethiopian mean? That term just means of the burnt face, of the black face. So um, this, is, this is who they knew African people to be at that time. And they claimed they were the most beautiful of, us, of all people and the most knowledgeable of all people, according to antiquities, uh, based off guys like Herodotus, Aristotle, uh, all these Greek philosophers, Plato, all of these guys study uh, guys like Imhotet who was actually the first uh, mega genius that the world had ever seen constructing the first pyramid of Dozier. So it's a lot of history to uncover. This is why they had to separate Egypt from Africa because if you leave Egypt in Africa, then basically you're saying we learned everything from black people and that's not what they wanted to do. That was not the narrative Eurocentric scholarship wanted. <laughs> if, that is, if that is the attention that they have paid because the other day I was still checking, Egypt was still in Africa. They still haven't moved. <laughs> Not that Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll tell you, you know, that Europeans were in Africa uh, building uh, pyramids in 133 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> it, just, it, just, it just doesn't line up geographically, and it also doesn't it line up, period, you know, physically. It can't happen. It wouldn't happen. Anyway, Emmanuel, now let's uh, go back to, let's start from the story itself mm -hmm. uh, the Pharaoh, the Black Pharaoh. Yeah. Now, how did this project start? Give us the background of the project itself. Yeah, when I first came up with the title, I Black Pharaoh, Golden Age of Triumph, people was thinking that the term black means black skin. No. To the Egyptians, the term black meant ascended into the God form or completion. So when you hear the term I black Pharaoh to be clear, the term I black Pharaoh simply means I am the Pharaoh of completion, which was Tutmosis the, the third. Um, I was researching. Originally, I was doing a film. I was working on a film about my great ancestor, Shaka Zulu. If you look at my last name, Kulu and Zulu, you know, we're only one letter off. We are literally of the same tribe and derived of the same tribe. So I initially wanted to do something in South Africa. Um, we ran into some problems because of the Shaka Zulu film of 1986. 
um, they didn't allow us to get the copyrights to, to do uh, a new film. So we kind of just put that project to the wayside. And I started to recall what I went through as a child, you know, and um, I said, you know what? We couldn't do a Shaka Zulu. So let's now let's do Egypt. So I wanted to find someone somewhat like Shaka Zulu in North Africa. And it came down to Ramses the Great, Taharka, and Tutmosis the Third. Those were the three Egyptian pharaohs that I was looking at as possibly doing a story about. So um, then I started reading about a great queen, you know, and I was like, who, who a great queen can I talk about? I know I said, I don't want to talk about Cleopatra. I don't want to talk about Nefertiti because they're always bringing them up. I want to do someone else. So I came across this queen called Hapshetsu, who ruled the world for 25, 20 to 25 years. And it was undoubtedly that these were African. When you look at these uh, sculptures of Tutmosis III and um, Hapshetsu. So I decided these, these are going to be the two African kings and queens that I'm going to discuss. And it just so happened that they were um, right after, they reigned right after each other and they had a uh, uh, great connection between each other. So I wanted to tell this story from an African perspective and that's where it began. That's very interesting. So when you discover the, the story, you you been in that, okay, this is a story I, I wanted to tell. How did you, uh, how did you go about it, talking from the point of view of research? Because now you need to know the story that you want to tell. All right. Well, you got to do a lot of traveling. You got to do a lot of research. When it comes to Egyptian antiquities, it's very important that you talk to the people of Aswan because Aswan is, is pretty much the black region of Egypt today. Um, so taking trips there, understanding what was happening in Egypt at that time, also doing research on each individual, uh, seeing their connections to each other. So it, 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 it takes a lot. It was a lot of research to understand the story, to see what did I want to fit in my story? What didn't I want to fit in the story? Um, I also used some biblical narratives as well to make connections to this Egyptian story, because if you if you go back and do the research on the biblical narrative, you find there's a lot of contact between ancient Israel and ancient Egypt. So I also tied that in within the story as well for those who are Bible believers um, to also make that connection as well. So it, it took a lot of research. I mean, you're talking three years of research uh, plus traveling. All right. Now, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what you find because you, you made mention of the connection between ancient Egypt and Israel. Tell me about that. Yeah. Okay, so when discussing the, the, the Bible, the Bible has never, uh, has always mentioned, uh, even in, in mentioning the Christ, it says, out of my son, out of Egypt, I will call my son, right? Um, but even going further back before Christ, you have Abraham's interaction with the Pharaoh in Egypt. You have um, Joseph being sold into Egypt and uh, being a, becoming, rising to a partial leader. And he and his brothers all took Egyptian wives. So you can see that these Egyptians and Israelites were interconnected from the very beginning of conception of the Israelite nation. Then also you have the story of Moses, uh, Moses being put into the Nile and being rescued by the Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses also took a Cushite wife. So you know that these, these Israelites were mixed with Africans. Now, some people would like to say Israelite people were um, Asiatic. Um, I tend to believe from their conception, they became Afro-Asiatic, whatever they originally were. They were mixing with Africans from the very beginning, as you see with Moses's wife and Joseph's, Joseph's wife as well. So these nations were inter interconnected from the very beginning, according to biblical studies. Okay. Now I'm having a little issue here uh, in that I'm trying to see if we can separate uh, belief from prehistoric things, no? I mean, like he, real historic events that have happened and the ones that, that are invented or that are, that are narrated as it were, no? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be maybe the story of Israel in Egypt, no? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, some historians say there is no evidence that they were actually there. But even yeah. they were there, I'm trying to see how well, much of archaeo it is actually... Ar ar yeah, archaeology does state 
there is a uh, on the back of one of the Egyptian stones um, on in Karnak, I believe it has the name of Yehovah, which is the name Jehovah in English. Um, so there is some evidence of that name and that's it was written in Hebrew. So we do know that there was some contact. Um, we don't know particularly how deep it was. There also were a people in Egypt called the Hyksos. And these Hyksos people were um, East, East Asian people who came into Egypt and ruled for a period of time. And many believe uh, at that time is when the Israelites were in Egypt. But again, um, it's really hard to pinpoint the actual evidence um, when it comes to you know, Egyptology and, and, and Israelite history. Mm -hmm. All right, that is actually the, 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 the part I wanted to ask for clarification. Okay, if you want to do it, it's fine. If not, we can move to the next one because Egypt in uh, Israel in Egypt is not the main topic of today. But since we are talking about it, you may mention of the Bible. That's why I just mm -hmm. wanted to uh, ask for a clarification on that part, especially mm -hmm. for the fact that a lot of uh, Africans, they don't read history, they don't read the Bible from a historical point of view. They read it literally. Like you say, uh, for example, uh, how many Israelites came in uh, how many actually went? I would have no logical conclusion. It, it's not possible. <laughs> but if we, if all of them were to come and just give it back every day, multiply like rats, they will not produce the number of people that went out from the number of people that came in. One. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, the fact that uh, they were going out then that is this uh, um, super superpower God who divided the water into two like blocks so that the people can pass through it when the uh, the uh, Egyptian soldier were coming. They perish in the water you know people read this one to be something that that really happened no that is why it is very important that we have historians and archaeologists and people who really who should explain what the bible is actually saying there because it is not there is no logic behind those type of explanation so that is why we're trying to say whether we are missing mythology to historic event something that is that is a kind of um uh, a faith-based belief and a re historic belief. That is why I was asking the question there. Yeah, 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 definitely, you know, for those who believe in the Bible, again, it is based off your belief, what you believe, um, you know, so uh, that that all depends on what you believe and what you don't believe, depending on whether you believe it's fairy tale or you believe it's the real thing. Uh, for those who truly do believe, um, they believe these events truly happen and those who don't, they need more proof to say that these people were actually in Egypt. So there is a divide there. Okay, that is fine. And that is fair enough. In fact, one of the things I also like very much about it, also in this conversation, is that we can agree to disagree and we can disagree even to agree, you know? But let's keep talking because by talking, they will be re revealing things. I will be learning from you and you will be learning from me. And if we do this more, there will be a lot of knowledge about the things that have passed. Uh, so that we can learn about it because you were it there i were it there but we are trying to find evidence of what has happened in the past this way we can have more knowledge so i want to yep. thank you again for your for your work no uh, now you, may, you may mention of the aswan people in egypt uh, as the mm -hmm. black uh, people black e egyptian uh, some mm -hmm. of the place you went to do your research when you were carrying out this story i don't know if i'm correct about that mm -hmm. okay can you tell me what some of the things that you find there i don't know maybe some uh something that become helpful to you in Making of your story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, these uh, people of Aswan, they're labeled as Nubians today um, to kind of put a separation between them and Egyptians. But these are the native people of Egypt. In fact, these are still the only people in Egypt who still speak that pharaonic language. OK, um, yes, they speak Arabic as well, but they also uh, speak that pharaonic language amongst themselves with those in North Africa don't even particularly understand. So um, you definitely they definitely are very much aware of their history, very much aware that they are the people that started this. And this is what was told to me by a brother from Aswan is, you, you know, we are the ones who started this, who built these pyramids and all these things that you travel here to see. You know, and, and I said, I'm, I'm quite aware of that, but I wanted to know if they knew some knew and many didn't 
many didn't know this education and that's due to oppression the oppression on black people around the world i mean you're talking about even in india the blacks in india are being oppressed the blacks in china are being oppressed uh the blacks in egypt are being oppressed the blacks in the uk are being oppressed black people everywhere south america north america are being oppressed and their history is being wiped out by Eurocentric scholarship uh, with a sort of trying to brainwash these people into believing that you are not the native Egyptians, uh, but the, those who look more Arabic looking are the original Egyptians, which is not the case. So um, uh, uh, you, you do find brothers that are very much enlightened, but they're very much in fear to speak out about these things in fear of governments coming after them and them disappearing. That is painful, it's really painful. It is. Right. now. Mm, what is your story based on? At the end of the day, you did your research, you find mm. evidence. Then I want to believe that you base it on the, on the, on a particular uh, story from what you find. No? Can you share with that? Yeah, yeah. Again, um, Hepshetsu uh, being this great queen of Egypt um, that hasn't been talked about. And at first, when you look into the book, you're going to find that the term Egypt is very seldomly used. And the reason before that is. These, these ancient people who we call today Egyptians were called themselves Kemites or people of Kemet, which means land of the blacks or the black land. Um, I made that very um, apparent so that people can start to make the connection between Egypt. Now, the term Egypt is a Greek word. Uh, it, came, it derives from Egyptus, is which the Greeks used describing Egypt, which also means the burnt face ones. Um, but the original land was called Kemet by these people. They called it Kemet or Kem, land of the blacks. And, and Hapshetsut is given in many inscriptions, was the one who brought peace to Egypt. Um, this great queen um, had a reign of peace for over 20 to 25 years. Tutmosis III, who followed her, was the most dominant warrior pharaoh. So when I said I was looking for someone like Shaka Zulu, um, Tutmos III conquered into the Kushite nation as south as the Kushite nation and as north all the way into the Black Sea. So this, this um, pharaoh had bringing Egypt to new heights, even going into a lots of part of Southeastern Asia, taking them as African as well. And we can still see the remnant of that today. When we go into places like the Middle East and the Mediterranean, you still see a strong Black presence there. So I kind of wanted to start with there in my story to um, show that Africans were conquerors as well. Af Africans uh, always brought knowledge to the table, spirituality to the table, as well as uh, had unity at one point, something that we don't see. So that's what the heart of the story was for me, uh, black beauty, black spirituality, black power, and as well as black expansion. So how was, um... How was unity portrayed there? Because uh, I'm asking the question because if you look at Africa today, it's one of the things that is actually uh, um, that, that is that is a big problem uh, for us all across the continent. No, we can take example of Cameroon, where your father is from, or from Nigeria mm -hmm. or Congo, or in, in many just all across Africa. No, in, in that we are, we have become it has become impossible for us to unite because there is no way you can progress until you unite. No. But even there in the United States, you can also uh, testify to it that we have it among us all across. All, uh, all down. So uh, let's try to learn something from Tutmos the, the, the third, according mm -hmm. to your story. So how were they able to, um, to manage the diversity? Because as we know, Egypt, there are be people of different cultural backgrounds, but they managed to, to govern over there. So that even the idea of democracy, of representation, it's something that we don't really have to add in, in Greek. We need to start from Egypt because these are people that have established the basis of human mm -hmm. understanding, of governance, yes. of representation and all that. How did you see them organizing themselves, particularly in unity uh, with different people? Yeah, when you look at um, the rise of, there was a pharaoh known as Amos. And Amos was the Egyptian who finally conquered these people, these Eastern Asiatic people who developed, who rose up in the intermediate period, which is like the 12th to 14th dynasty of Egypt, who rose up and took Egypt. Um, Amos was a native Egyptian uh, from the South who basically brought Egypt back 
to to world dominance again, to the original native people and kick these Hyksos people out of Egypt. Um, Tutmosis the third, the third and Abshetsuts are, are, are dis, dis direct descendants of Amos. Um, and they also wanted to restore what Egypt originally was after these Asiatics had come in and, to and kind of destroyed the, uh, the native Egyptians history. Um, so they kind of brought it back. You know, as I mentioned earlier, Hapshetsu brought uh, great monumental um, monuments and architectures and Tutmosis used conquering. So he, they spread a lot of their knowledge through trade, through Hapshetsu, uh, making great connections all the way down to Somalia, Uganda. Um, and then you have um, Tutmos III, who used conquest. So these two pharaohs, they used two different ways. One used trade, the other one used conquest. Um, so there they were able to bring Egypt back to its full height, known as the New Kingdom, which happens to be the greatest of all Egyptian history is the New Kingdom. I don't know if you want to say something relating to, since uh, Tutmos is the, the, the third, uh, like you described him, was a, a warrior king in that they have to move even beyond the border and conquer other land then the the strategy will become very important for us now because uh do you is there anything that you want to share with us there like what kind of strategies he employed to be able to conquer these people did all the army come from egypt or did they do like the roma did like roma enter a land then sort of conquer the people indoctrinate them um put them as part of the army to continue to fight other armies so the, the empire just begin to expand and expand. Is that mm -hmm. something like that or they, they came to the land, they conquer, they go over or they stay in the land to dominate it and, and all that. Is there anything mm -hmm. that we can we can hear from there? Well, yeah, absolutely. Tutmosis III, when he conquered certain nations, some of the priests, the kings of these nations would become servants to him, but also would become governments to these la these lands for the simple fact that he felt that these people still knew this land. So if Tutmosis came into, for example, Kush, if he came into Kush and took over Kush for a time period, he would preserve some of these who were willing to, um, to, to rule under him as governors in their respective lands. He would allow, he would take them to Egypt, train them on the Egyptian ways, and then send them back to their homeland to instruct on Egyptian ways. That's if they chose to chose to do so. Others who didn't, they perished. This is the way uh, Tutmosis the Third did things, and he did the same thing in the Levant. Same thing all the way up into what they call today uh, present day Canaan. He did the exact same thing. So this was their way of doing things when it comes to conquest. Of uh, we're going to take the, the strongest from these areas, and we're going to teach them our history or they will be annihilated. This is how it was done in ancient times. So this is how the knowledge of Egypt really spread throughout Africa and uh, Eastern Asia as well, uh, it's because Tutmosis III did things this way. All right, now that's another thing I'm trying to understand from here, you know, that when we look at a story of, um, of conquest, of colonialism, of, of conquering the people, to some persons it might appear as if it's something new, but what I offer, believe is that this is something that have been around for a very long time. Human beings have yes. been dominating other human beings. Uh, uh, of course, one justification might be today, okay, the American need oil, so that is why they invade Iraq, you know? But there was a time that was no oil in Iraq. If there is no oil in Iraq, that would be another reason why maybe America or another country will want to invade Iraq or another country. But one country is always entering into the territory of another country, taking the people, uh -huh. dominating them. If slavery is allowed, then they use slavery. If it's not allowed, then other things will be used. So now, in the case of uh, um, of, of this uh, African king who have uh, gone to other parts of the world to conquer, do we have anything like maybe what could be the po Okay, this is something that happened many, many years ago. I have no, I'm not expecting that you can give me every little detail of it, no? but at least based on your study, you can share with us what you find. No? So that is the basis. Okay. So can we know anything like why? Why did they have to go to these places to conquer? What was the motive? What was the reason? What was the just the motive? The motive is the same as it is today. Resources. You know, gold is not indigenous to Egypt. <laughs> and that's very that's, that, that needs to be known. So obviously it, it would be acquired through trade or conquest. 
one of one way or the other. So we know that um, it has always been um, Egypt has always given its reverence to the south of it, um, whether it be uh, Somaliland, whether it be Kenya, whether it be Uganda, whether it be modern day Ethiopia, which was called the land of Pune at the time. Um, these nations had great wealth that Egypt wanted. So whether it was through trade or conquest, Egypt uh, used its power to its army, its military forces to, uh, you know, to, you know, subjugate these other nations at that time, and also to unite the known world of Africa at that time. And this is very important, you know, uh, Emmanuel, it's really very important. You see, mm -hmm. uh, there was, I think it was 2015, I did a documentary about Pan-Africanism, and I titled it Pan-Africanism, Thirsty Idea on Reality, you know, and that is Thirsty, the, the beautiful African idea on real situation, which is, I used the, what is happening in Africa to test if actually uh, how beautiful it is in the idea is actually what it is in reality, you know. By that, mm -hmm. I'm trying to say that... Uh, uh, sometimes when we look at Africa, we look at it, but not all of us, and not in all the cases, sometimes. We look mm -hmm. at it and say, we are people that have always been peace lovely. we never make war, we don't fight. I know all of us, hey, just peace and love. No, But it is not true. It's not peace and love no. all the time. We are no. just like every other people. We fight, we war, we kill, we maim. Mm -hmm. We are just like every other person in the world. No? Uh, and I think we need to tell the story like this, so that we, we are not different. I don't see us to be different. No? So we're, we're not. We're not. I mean, we had our times of peace. We had our time. And, you know, it's it's very interesting in Pan-Africanism. You, you're starting to hear a lot of people bring up the name Mansa Musa. And um, Mansa Musa was this Western Mali king who uh, was the, considered to be the richest man of the 13th and 14th century in the world. Um, but what, what, what people don't know is Mansa Musa's pilgrimage to Mecca giving away billions of dollars in gold uh, to Egypt and into Mecca, this knowledge became known to Europeans and Arabians on the wealth that Sub-Saharan Africa had due to Mansa Musa's pilgrimage. And this is why you see in 1492, 1493, where you start to see all these mercenaries being sent to places like Africa, India, shortly after the reign of, of, of Mansa Musa, you start to see Europeans start to set out, they call them today explorers. They were sent out to find the source of this gold in India and in Africa, because all they had known is that these people were black skin people. So they went to these two areas looking for the gold and the wealth due to what Mansa Musa did. And they also knew that he was a Muslim. So they were going into areas that they thought that they would find this gold. And, and, and in 1493, they had finally circumvented Africa and began what we know today as white supremacy. When somebody uh, have conquered you, of course, you can call it whatever you like. Uh, as long as he remains your conqueror, there is very little you can do until you are able to unturn the table. And then mm -hmm. that justice that you were looking for the, the other time, you were saying everybody should be equal. We should treat everybody. <laughs> nobody should enter into my territory. You will see yourself now enter into the territory of another person. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It simply means to the African people who are listening to us that, hey, you have done this to other people too. Maybe not in this, maybe not in this measure that they are doing to you. Maybe maybe not in this the strategy, in the stamina, in the way that the Europeans are doing it to you. Because right. I don't believe, I don't believe that the European and Africa were only meeting a few hundreds of years ago. Because we are mm -hmm. too close to be meeting at this period. Mm -hmm. We have met many, many years before. You know, not even with the with uh, Hannibal just before, as the Roman were growing up, who came to Italy and all the destruction that he did with the African elephant and all that. Of course, some of this we don't even read in the in our regular history book because saying that an Africa coming to Europe and doing that, of course, it doesn't give any pride to the to the narration of the day. You no. Know? So what I'm actually mm -hmm. trying to say here is that we must look at story that we are on both sides of it. We have done both exactly. good and bad. This is the way we are able to understand. Because if we are telling it from the point of view that ah, we are always peace loving, we have never done any bad, then it's sort of we fit into the narration that we have never really done anything at all. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, you, you, if you're going to claim African history, you got to claim all of it. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> if we're going to claim African history, we got to claim that some Africans sold Africans into slavery. Uh, we're going to have to claim that we conquered other na African nations, that we conquered into Europe. I mean, you talk about the Moors who were North Africans who, who ruled Spain for over 700 years and dominated them. So we, we have to claim that history as well. We, we all can't of it, just, all of it. <laughs> we just can't just say that, oh, we, all everything we did it was, was was good and, and, and beautiful. No, we conquered nations and, you know, we subjugated people. And, we, you know, e e even the, the, the biblical narrative, uh, as we spoke about earlier, talks about Egyptians uh, enslaving Israelites. So uh, people have always there's slavery has always happened, probably not to the extent that we saw here in America where people were being burned on stakes and, you know, people were being hung in front of public and people were treated as less than human. Um, probably not to that extent, but we do know that oppression has always been a part. I mean, as long as there's wealth and greed at stake and expansion, uh, I think people have always done that from the beginning of man's history. <laughs> Absolutely, and I also think looking at maybe what you said, though, like the American burning people on the on the on the stake. Actually, the European burning African on the stake. No, uh, I think that test because you see, I think our historians have a huge responsibility in how they construct our narration. It, it helps people to understand where they are coming from. It is very important to know that the story is not only one side; it's both sides. Even the European, it's not that everything the European have done in Africa is bad. They have also done good in Africa and to the African people. So mm -hmm. when we tell the story, we need to tell it on both sides. Of course, it's, it's true that when you are telling a pure neutral story, because there are not really neutral stories. That is why I'm saying that as a European are telling their, the story, the world story, telling it from the point of view of the European, we as Africans should not pretend to be represented in that story. It is not possible. Because if right. they represent you, they will be doing a disservice to themselves. Because they case, don't know of, enough about it. They yeah, don't exactly. know. They, they don't cannot. know. They, you can't know. It's just like asking a European what was Native American culture. You know, they're not going to know. You know, they wipe most of those people out. So they don't particularly know everything. They know some things of what they're interacted with. And just like you can't look for certain sources on African history and find them uh, based on European scholarship, you're just not going to find it. You're going to find it through the people of that land, the native people who pass stories down through their artifacts, through their uh, their monuments, through their structures. African told Africans told stories differently. Yes, we documented our history and a lot of it you'll find in the, the British and the French Museum. <laughs> you'll find a lot of African artifacts there um, and you find African artifacts all over the world. So, um, you know, people base things based off their own understanding of what they have been told, not what is the actual history of these people. Only these people can tell you that history. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is why I want to come back to what you were saying before. You know, that is a beautiful thing that you said, no? that uh, the African story is so documented, of course, in the context of the time that we have it today, which means that African uh, people have the time now to tell their story of the time that we are experiencing. What have been our experience at least in this last 500 years? We can't expect the European to tell that story. It is not possible. Or we tell that story or that story remain untold because we tell it differently with our sentiment, with our feeling, with how we see it. That is how that story is going to be told. It's not going to be told by somebody who just imagine maybe that's how I now I slap you, I will tell you how you feel. You cannot tell me how I feel. I'm mm. the only one that can tell you how I feel. That is why it is the only African people that can tell their story. Exactly. Now coming to telling the story, in this particular story that you are working on, what would you say is a central message that you want to pass across? The central message is that African history has been misrepresented, um, but also the, the, the story itself is just to show you, bring you into ancient Egypt. When we think about ancient Egypt, a lot of times we kind of look at all this mysticism and all of these, uh, you know, these people who built these pyramids. We, it's almost like we see them as magical people, people who who weren't even really people. Right. But um, the story, the context I painted it in, that these were spiritual people people who um, were met were very intelligent, mastered science, mastered archaeology, uh, mastered architecture, uh, mastered uh, were masters of astrology, that these people were 
uh, the masters of the elements as well, the masters of the weather, the masters of understanding different things, uh, how the animals connect with human beings and all of these different things, the insects. I mean, you have uh, a lot of Egyptians worshiping certain, certain creatures as well, such as the black cat or the bombardier beetle, uh, the respect for the nature Egyptians have. Even in fact, Egyptians put people to death for, you know, killing a certain animal, a baboon or a certain animal that it was of great reverence to them. Um, so it, it's a lot of great history to connect back to, to understand that Africans did things completely different, but to see these people as actually people, they had feelings, they had love, they had conquest, they had anger, they had stress, they had worries, they had concerns. Don't just see Egypt as just people who were building pyramids and doing all this glorious stuff, but don't see them that they were actually still people. And I think that's what we miss a lot of times when we talk about ancient Egypt. All right. That is very important. And I, I'm going to put another question from there that I'm trying to understand now uh, in that irrespective of what the European would tell us about Egyptians, we know that we are the Egyptian. We, the people of Africa, are the Africans. Mm -hmm. There are not two, you cannot just recreate the people. No, we are what we are. So, Egypt at the point disintegrated, a lot of people uh, migrated to other parts of Africa because, of course, they are Africans. No, where do you want them to go? They can't go anywhere. No, these are people that have been moving from northwest, south of the continent. Just like, for example, in Europe, you have the European, you, mm -hmm. you, are, the, you are the German, you go to French, you are still a European, you move from France to Italy, you are still the same people. No. So in the mm -hmm. same way, Africans were moving all around, no? Exactly. Well, and it's not, it's not yeah, talked yeah. about, though. It's not talked about. If you think about it, um, <clears throat> as these invasions came into Egypt, and keep this in mind, Egypt was once a very tropical region. You know, it was very much, the, the, that part of the Nile Valley was very tropical. But over time, it became a desert. It became a desert. And people started migrating out of there. Due to uh, famines, due to uh, extreme weather conditions, people got out of there due to the floods that were happening in Aswan. People left Egypt and more than likely they went south, um, where uh, Narmer mentions that he came from the place of the moon, which my people believe these ancient Egyptian people originated in the Uganda area. And they came up, well, came up the now in those days they went south but in these days today they label it north they went north to what they call egypt and took this region uh, that we call uh, egypt today so um the egyptians has always given reference to the south they always have as the strength of their glory even even um, the city of memphis was in the south of egypt so that was the the capital city of Egypt. So that was always known to be the strength of Egypt. And this was uh, a part of Black Africa as well. Right. Uh, now, I, I'm trying to ask another thing. Of course, related to the question, a series of questions I asked you in the beginning, you know, which have to do with uh, what people are feeling, uh, people of your age and all that, because you don't... Uh, now, it appears that you are trying to throw the story of, of some people. But actually, you are truly your own story. You are finding your own identity. That is what it is at the end of the day. Now, you are no longer a child now. You have grown or you are an adult. You are uh, doing an international business, involvement and all that, telling stories and creating movie. You are basically creating a narration. Mm -hmm. So the people of your time these days, you go around within the US in New York area. What do they tell you about this particular story that you are digging? They, lo they absolutely love it. You know, at first, you know, many people outside of the African uh, race were somewhat offended because it's different. They have never seen Egypt in this context. So some people were offended. And this brought a lot of hate mail to me. I got a lot of hate mail due to this, brother. You know, it, it, it was very tough uh, dealing with people saying, oh, you are Afrocentric lies. You're lying. Uh, this isn't the truth. You know, I dealt with that in the very beginning of just posting a book cover on social media. I started to get a lot of hate mail from different parts of Egypt, from uh, that more more likely the Cairo part of Egypt, uh, from European scholars that were sending things like completely historically inaccurate to try to disprove it. Um, but over time, people who actually took the time to read the book, they absolutely loved it. And this is of all races. And I think it's important for everyone to know 
the human story. You just can't tell one side of the human story and say, um, you know, the others had no effect on history. So I think when it comes to this, we hear about Alexander the Great. We hear about, um, you know, uh, Julius Caesar as these great monarchs of, of uh, these great monarchs of uh, ancient Europe. But we don't hear about our own. We're just now starting to hear about Shaka Zulu and Queen Nandi, Yai Shantue, Queen Imani Reyes, Queen Hapshetsu, Tutmos III, King Tut. It's also clear that these were African people. And it's also this, to, what I always give in my presentations is to know that African people produce more women rulers than anywhere on the face of the planet. And that's not to say that Africa was you know, not male dominated, but it is to say that the woman's role in Africa was always respected. It was always respected. I mean, you have women in government, women in spirituality, um, women as priests, um, women as absolute rulers, more absolute rulers of African descent and women than there are anywhere else documented in the world history. So it's also very important for African women who hear these stories and hearing this around the world and they're like, wow, you know, these white liberation movements for women didn't start until the, the, the 1960s where they started to liberate themselves. But African women have been had great roles in, in, uh, in African history um, far before any women liberation movement. So I think that's also important and it's empowering. And I think people receive it well because of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now, of course, when you do a work like this, that is uh, controversial, you may say, you know, because you are contesting a traditional narration. Of course, you sometimes expect some criticism, right? Even though if, mm -hmm. if you don't receive criticism, meaning the work, the, the work that you are doing is worthless. So you must have people that, that appreciate it and some other that criticize it. So if mm. you were to look at some of your criticism, which one would you say um, is the most touching for you? What are, what are, the, what are the main criticisms that people tell you about in this work? Um, the main one was the race thing. The race thing was the big, the big criticism that, um, that, that I got. Um, but I will say from uh, a great... Uh, a great scholar that we had who recently passed away, Renoko Rashidi. Um, I remember my very first seminar back in 2016, um, I was speaking about how all the, the noses in Egypt had been broken. And I had mentioned that it's been documented by, um, that Napoleon did that. I found that not to be true. <laughs> so uh, we don't have evidence for those who are saying that, that Napoleon broke all the noses in Egypt to prove that these were not Egyptian statues. Um, Renoku uh, definitely uh, enlightened me to saying it possibly could have happened, but we don't know it for factual to say, to, to go out there and start teaching as if it's true. So he said, out of everything else you said, you said it was good, but this was a constructive criticism I can take for myself to say, instead of saying that Napoleon actually did break all the noses in Egypt, to say it's a possibility that this was done by some sort of Euro Eurocentric power that was trying to wipe out the, the original face of Egypt when they came into Egypt. But we don't know who it is. It could have been the Persians. It could have been the Greeks. It could have been the Romans. It could have been way after. It could have been the Arabs. Um, but to try to pinpoint it on one person that we have no evidence for uh, was wrong. So that was a cr criticism that I took and in, 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 in accepted it because there is no proof of that statement. Um, but other things was mostly based on the race, which obviously that's due to them being educated a certain way. So obviously I didn't take that with, with anything, you know. That's, that's interesting. And when you show the book to, to, um, to, to, academ to academia, people who have studied, you know, you know, one thing is to have it read by somebody who knows you or maybe somebody who just find the book, a kind of a random person. Another thing is to give it to somebody like you mentioned of uh, mm -hmm. Rashidi, uh, somebody who who's well uh, vast in this, in this feed. What has been their reaction? I mean, expert in the feed. Oh, Dr. Rashidi loved it. Um, um, you know, um, I've gotten support from Brother Kaba Kabane, who is also teaching a lot about it. I've got some support from uh, Vanessa Davies, 
who was a former, she, she still is actually an Egyptologist. I've gotten support from uh, Solange Ashby, who is the only black Egyptologist. Shout out to Solange Ashby. She's, there's only one black Egyptologist. So her name is Solange Ashby, a good friend of mine, as well as Dr. Sally Ann Ashton, uh, who is also a former Egyptologist. And she is now known as the Kemet expert. These are uh, Robert Bouval. These are all people who um, have supported, and these are scholars. These are African scholars that have, and Egyptian scholars that have studied this history, and they absolutely love the book because they believe it's time. It's time to see Egypt in its true African context. So they have been a great support. So shout out to them. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, that is the question I wanted to ask you. It's like you read my thoughts that it's time. So what I want to really ask you uh, is, um, why is it that now Africans more than ever before should start talking about this particular story that you are talking about? Because very few Africans actually are writing about Egypt, even mm. though Egypt is one of the most uh, talked about in Africa and in the world. So, of course, you will imagine that that conversation should be dominated by Africans since Egypt is in Africa. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how would you encourage more Africans to be writing to be documenting about africa because for example uh, some uh, scholars have said that or well, this is not rumor that when they go inside the tomb in egypt they see that some evidence have been tampered with to try because a lot of things have been done to say that these are not africa but the evidence are too obvious at the point you just can't, you are you are helpless right you know so you don't have to leave it the way it is but they are there the way they are you are still expecting that maybe those same people will come and say, ah, but these people, ah, look at how beautiful these uh, black pharaoh are. You're not going to hear that. The issue we run into with African, um, those on the continent. I mean, I believe the diaspora, uh, those abroad are, are more doing this work because we have more so, so the freedom, so to speak, to do so. Whereas even in Af the African continent now, I need a passport to go from Nigeria to, Cam to Cameroon or Cameroon to Nigeria. We, you know, we still have to deal with those issues, these border issues that have separated us. That's not allowing us to do that. Sheikh Anti Diop had the means to do so. He had the means, he had the connections, to be able to go back and forth to Egypt and have these debates. And even so, he was denied. He was denied the opportunity to even test the pharaohs by Egyptian antiquities. So there are powers that are in place that don't allow the thorough research to be done. Even when you're in Egypt, you'll notice that you know, you're looked at a, a certain way when you're, you're an African doing African scholarship in Egypt, they look at it like, oh, 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 well, here, here these people go, keep an eye on them, watch them. They'll mistreat you sometimes. So it's a lot of things that Africans are facing to be able to actually do this work. So that's what makes it extremely hard. It's the politics in Africa and it's different politics, different countries that uh, don't allow Africans to really go and do the, the, the research that they need to be done in order to really speak about this. All right. Now, this, since you have done the research yourself, can you share with us what have been your challenges while you were on the ground there trying to gather information? Because like I said before, we cannot expect our historian to just regurgitate stories that have been told by the European. You really need to be on the ground. If you want to write about ancient Zimbabwe, you don't need to imagine it. Zimbabwe is in Africa. As an African, you should have access to the information. Dig it up. You want to test, test. They say it's true if you want to write about ancient Bini. These are not things that you can just imagine. They are there. Evidence are there, no? Mm -hmm. So when we want to write about Nubian story, Egypt, we, we should be able to have access to those places. But like you correctly said, there are a lot of blockage that is not permitting a lot of African historians to dig into their history because this story, this, this intention to make sure that we don't know about our history is not an invention. It's real. And it's really, so share with me, what were your challenges when you were there on the ground trying to gather information? Oh, man, you know, it, again, speaking about certain things in places like that could be very dangerous. I mean, you can quickly disappear, you know, you know, no matter who you are, no matter your passport, you can disappear in some of these regions 
by speaking certain things. I mean, you're not even really allowed to bring cameras into some of these museums to be taking pictures of certain things unless you have a pass to do so. You can't go to certain excavation sites without having a pass to do so. Uh, there are places in Aswan that you have to get a pass from the government and explain why you want to research this particular area in order to go there and they can deny it. And it can take up to a year, two years before they even address you. So that's a very, that, those are blockades right there that, you know, lack of being able to access certain things to really dig and get into the nitty gritty of what was, is very difficult because the gov government very much controls these regions and these excavation sites that it doesn't allow every historian to just get there. And uh, this is, uh, since this is uh, the story that we would want to tell, uh, as, an, as a person who have tested this evidence, who have been there, you have seen the, the blockage yourself because you wanted to tell this, you want to tell this story, but you see somehow the system is telling you, no, 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 you, no, they are telling you no, but sometimes you get yes, otherwise you will not be able to, to get anything from them. And sometimes you got to use a white. Sometimes you got to use a white face to get a yes. <laughs> Tell us about okay. that. I didn't get. Sometimes, sometimes you might have that. to. You, there are there are a, a number of great white allies that are out there. I mentioned some earlier that that believe the same thing that you and I believe that the origins began in Africa. That will that you can ally with and go out to Egypt and get some things done. You can get some things done, but uh, if you go with a group with all black people trying to get things done, uh, they're going to see what you're trying to do. They're going to see a motive behind what you're trying to do, and they're going to put some some blockades in your way. Now, what would you say in, in respect of maybe assuming somebody who is listening to you have the possibility of making it easier? Why why, why would they give you? Why would they open those places up for more for more research so that we can hear more story? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, starting, first of all, you know, these people were Africans and it's very important for African antiquities to to get in on the study of Egypt. Um, that being said, we all know that, you know, Professor Leakey, Mary Leakey, they came up with the theory of the out of the Africa movement, uh, which basically has become science. Right. So in order to really, you know, research and study science for new understanding and greater understanding than the past, we have to allow scholars from all different races to come in and to put race aside and to really uh, diagnose what was happening in these places and not scholars who are coming from a Eurocentric um, scholarship or Eurocentric perspective, because you're not going to know. Now, when you're talking about spirituality in Egypt. You're talking about the arch architecture. These are all shared throughout the African continent. There are many similarities between African culture and other African, uh, Egyptian culture and other African civilizations. So that connection alone should allow Africans to get into the antiquity studies of ancient Africa in Egypt. Um, now, another thing I'm trying to understand is that, okay, this is a personal journey, like I said before, that you have under, undergone on, based on what has happened to you in school. And you try to represent uh, a story that you know, your story, because you're part of uh, the African heritage. Uh, you were denied. For this, you were given a, a negative uh, mark. So from them, something were born in you, this desire to tell this story. Mm -hmm. uh, now you continue to tell the story until you did. So what would you say is your satisfaction in all this work that you do? Uh, my satisfaction is, is, is seeing people put their race, their, what they were taught to the side and saying, let's get to the truth. You know, it's, it's anyone who has half a brain understands that one race or one group of people were not responsible for all the good things that have happened in this world. And getting people to understand that is an, it's, 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 it's beautiful for me. I enjoy teaching people of all different races um, the truth about African history. But if we're going to, it's not just African history, it's actually world history. I mean, you talked about the Benin, the walls of Benin or, or the great Benin kingdom. Um, we can talk about all the, the sculptures and architecture that are now in, in, in the French museum. But we can also talk about how this great Benin wall was the largest wall in the, the Guinness World Book of Records. Um, that's not talked about. We always hear about the great Chinese wall, but we don't hear about ancient Benin, which was 10 times the size of that. So uh, these things 
are relevant to world history, not just Africa. So in order to come get a fullness on world history, you have to know African history as well, which has been the most diluted history that uh, we know today. Uh, we're, we're almost done, huh? but I have two questions to ask you. No, actually, one is a question. The second one is just uh, your final message. No? Um, now, your attempt to tell this story, of course, you have some blockage, like you described before, no? some challenges and all that. But you still continue uh, anyway. So mm -hmm. what, what is what is motivating you? Why are you continuing to, to go on, even though there are some challenges on the way? Truth. Truth motivates me. You know, um, passion love for truth that motivates me to keep going forward to, to look at my brother and see that he doesn't know himself motivates me to not know the value of where you come from you know and, and, and a lot of it is not because they don't know it's just due to ignorance just not being taught it not knowing where to find this information so my goal as an african historian is to be able to spread the knowledge to those who want it those who want to have uh, to 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 know where they originate from, because you didn't just drop on this planet and became slaves. That's that's not it. That's not it. Or you didn't just wake up and Africa was colonized. There was a process. There's a there, there's something that happened called the Council of Berlin in 1884 and 1885 that not a single African was there to carve up Africa into different places. I mean, you talk about Cameroon, Nigeria, where we're pretty much neighbors, and you know. They shared culture together, but it, it was divided. It was divided by these borders. Same thing with, with, with Egypt, Kush, Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, Somali, Ethiopia, these nations that have been put against each other, so to speak, through these borders were family related. They knew each other. They were neighbors. You know, so uh, all of these different things we need to know about what happened in order for us to to push forward as Africans. I believe Kwame Nkrumah, Halal Selassie, their goal was to create an African union. But I think the issue, and this was told to me by uh, Dr. Arakani Chiramboy Kwao, shout out to her in the ADDI movement. Uh, she, she mentioned in one of her seminars that I attended that many, the problem with the African union in the beginning was that some leaders was like, let's do this now. And some leaders was like, let's go slow. And that let's go slow mentality is what didn't allow the union to do what it was supposed to do. Even a guy like Gaddafi, who was trying to create a united African currency. Can you imagine if that would have happened, what it would have done for Africa? Um, you know, then, then we wouldn't be going by these centralized banks that are in Europe today. So, um, Again, my motivation is knowing this information and being able to get it out to people, um, to see people enlightened and people who know more than they didn't know after they left my seminar than before or after they read my book than before when they read it. Thank you very much, Shima. I really appreciate the time that you spent here uh, sharing this information for us uh, with us. I learned a lot uh, from you, and I believe that other people that are listening to us now, they will also learn a lot from it. All right, to conclude the conversation, I mean, what would be your final message? Because people spend time to listen to you because they find it valuable. So what would be your message today to conclude it? My message today is in order to to have the fullness of world history, you have to have African history. We cannot we cannot sit here and say that the beginning of all civilization did not start in Africa. We have those who mentioned theories like the out of Africa movement that proves that Africa was the beginning of all life and all civilization. If that is the case, then in order to have world history in its fullness, we must have the fullness of African history. So my message to all those who are out there, continue to do your research. The time is now to where right now with the click of a button, you can find out more about African history than ever before. There were times where these things were, these things were locked up in books in certain libraries, which if you couldn't get to these libraries, you wouldn't know these things. But now the internet has opened up opened up the way of information now. So there's becoming more and more less lack of opportunity, less excuses not to have this knowledge. So continue to, to read, support African artists, support African uh, historians, support African literature, 
to to keep those things going out there so that we all know who we truly are. So that's my message. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel Kulu. It has been a pleasure on my part. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. You're welcome, my brother.